Hi, Levi here. Thanks for checking in. Uh, it's uh, probably one or two in the morning uh, in China. I think it's September 22nd. Um, and I just wanted to do a quick update. Um, how do you like my hair? Um, been growing it out for several months. And uh, usually I just kind of slick it back, but uh, this time I decided um, now I'm gonna start like letting it be what it actually is. So you can see the curl, um, and so. Uh, but anyways, uh, at McDonald's and uh, since I've been on vacation, I've uh, been living pretty nocturnally, um, which works for me because um, something uh, if you don't know about Chinese, uh, about about China is that it's noisy. Uh, it's very noisy in the day. So if this was if this was during the day, there would be a lot of horns honk, honking, um, and uh, and that tends to be yeah quite a bit louder. Uh, so yeah, so uh, and not only that, but being out at night, obviously there's a lot less cars. Well, except for this part of town, but uh, obviously there's a lot less cars. But also, uh, uh, it just it enables me to kind of avoid uh, some of the um, the unpleasantries um, of Chinese culture. And uh, not by any means to say that it's all bad, but just to say that, um, yeah, I mean it can be you know it's it's not easy adapting to a new culture. And even though I've been here uh, for two years, um, uh, it's best to think of it's best to think of adapting to a new culture um, like being a child and like being a born in a place. And if I had just been born in China just two years ago, um, it would I would be you know I would just be a two year old and. Um, and there's probably a high likelihood that um, my my language skills are probably not any more advanced than a two-year-old's would be in in terms of Chinese. Uh, but not only in terms of that, but also in terms of understanding the culture, understanding the people, understanding um, why people do things here. Uh, for instance, um, in America, in a fast food restaurant at McDonald's or Burger King, uh, clearly I'm outside of McDonald's right now. Um, when we leave a restaurant, we typically pick up our tray and empty empty the garbage and, and put the tray on top. But here in China, they don't do that. Here in China, uh, everybody always, almost almost always, at least 99.9% .9 of the time, um, leaves their tray with all the garbage um, on the table. Excuse me. Um, so this is something that... Um, it's just one of those things that's really hard for me to get used to. Um, um, or for instance, like I just saw a guy just looking over, people constantly throw their cigarette butts on the ground and just litter, uh, litter quite a bit. And um, it's not quite as bad in, in this city, uh, I, I guess, as it can be in other cities. Um, this city is relatively clean uh, by Chinese standards. Uh, but it still happens quite a bit. Um, or, for instance, um, something that's common here and it's not rude at all, although it would be considered really rude in America, um, is um, toddlers or babies will, uh, they, okay, like children's clothes here up to a certain age, they have built in slits for genitalia so the kids can squat and pee or poop right on the street or even inside. Um, for instance, I was, I was in a, a, a mall here, a really nice mall. Um, I mean, you could probably see your, your reflection in the floor, uh, at least somewhat. And I was waiting to get um, a bottle of water or something. Um, and this grandfather with his maybe one or two year old um, or maybe even three-year-old, uh, the, the, the child just squatted and was just peeing right on the mall floor and just urine going everywhere. And I'm like, okay, I'm not getting water here. I'm going to move on. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, and that's but that's actually fairly common. They usually not indoors, but a, a lot outdoors. Um, so uh, many times, yeah. So and those are, that's just a few of the things that can be difficult to get used to in China. Um, so for me, like being able to like kind of like during this period of time where I don't have to teach. Um, living a, a bit more nocturnally is kind of a uh, it's kind of like a, a break um, and uh, for anybody who's lived overseas um, there's definitely a, a big learning curve to it I mean you'll hear it called like culture shock um, and that but that, that I think that's kind of a misnomer because uh, culture shock uh, it kind of causes me to think of like a, like a moment where culture is really hard to get used to. Um, but actually, I found I found the term culture stress to be uh, much more accurate uh, because culture stress, um, like stress, is something that we typically uh, encounter emotionally because of a series of circumstances or a, or, a con, or a constant way of thinking. Um, and so in, in, a, in a foreign country, um, and getting used to a foreign context, culture stress, like it's much more representative. Um, I liken it to, uh, I liken it to getting shocked um, a thousand times a day by a nine volt battery. You know, maybe when you were a kid, um, uh, you were curious about it as I was, and you would touch a nine volt battery to your tongue. Not sure if you did that. Maybe I'm alone in that. But um, uh, moving to a new culture like China uh, is like getting those kinds of shocks all over your body all the time and not knowing where they're coming from. Um, and so the longer I live here, it's like, okay, I've developed, I slowly develop a way of getting used to all the shocks. Um, uh, but they still happen. And uh, so I think to be healthy, what it really takes to deal with something like that um, is uh, a strong emotional awareness. Um, many of us, um, when uh, emotional, emotionally, uh, unpleasant or negative or troubling things happen um, uh, we tend to numb we try to numb the source of that of that unpleasantness or pain or whatever it is um, un instead of facing it and doing and being proactive about it and instead of leaning into it asking ourselves why um, keeping a journal, processing it through it somehow with people uh, that we trust. Um, um, and so I do that sometimes, but uh, a lot of the times I've just uh, numbed it. And so um, but the best way to uh, the best way to deal with that kind of culture stress or culture shock, because there can be moments of shock, but it's more like just being overwhelmed. Whereas in like if you're in a, a stressful situation, but if you continue to be in that situation every day, um, then eventually that if if that isn't dealt with, then it can eventually become overwhelming and kind of um, well explode and like a like a like a volcano under pressure. And so um, so yeah, there's different ways to deal with that. One is to keep just a journal uh, and to tell the truth about um, what happened uh, in those events or that day. Um, I find that um, writing down what has happened in a day um, and not, not, not my feelings about it, not my opinions of it, but just writing down what happened and what I did and what happened in the day, that can be a way to, um, uh, to create emotional space. Um, Sometimes we think of uh, processing or externalizing emotion uh, or stress um, in, in an emotional way, as in like I have to express my emotions about it, or at least that's maybe that's that's one of the ways that I think about it. Um, 
but actually uh, another and that, and that can be healthy to vent sometimes but sometimes venting can actually make the problem worse um, because we um, whatever we whatever our attention is focused on becomes bigger uh, in our minds and in our emotions so it can actually it can not always but it can um, at the wrong times actually cause the the extension the the problems of that culture or situation to become bigger in our minds. So one of the ways to deal with, uh, one of the possible ways to deal with culture stress um, or just uh, emotional unpleasantness is to tell the truth about that situation. And what I mean by that is more of a factual truth. Not our opinions, not even our feelings about it, but what actually happened. And uh, when we write that down, then we're able to, um, after the fact, observe it uh, with more rationality, with more calmness. Um, and, and then, in those circumstances, we can reinterpret those circumstances according to uh, um, um, a, a less harmful narrative. Um, um, for instance, um, maybe, uh, like, okay, like in China, like, uh, that one of the first things I learned uh, uh, when I got here is that a lot of Chinese people smoke. Uh, it's very common. And they smoke almost anywhere. So, um, since I'm from California, um, in California, it's not legal to smoke within like 20 feet of the, of the entrance of a place like Starbucks or something. Uh, but in China, people smoke everywhere. And so, um, and so for me, like one of the, one of the narratives that I would tell myself in the beginning is, oh my gosh, like Chinese people are so rude because they smoke indoors and they leave their garbage everywhere and blah, 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 and just all these complaints. Um, but what I, and, uh, but what I had to realize, um, was that it, even though I considered it rude, even though that was the narrative I was giving the fact, I mean, what was the fact? A person smoked a cigarette inside. That was the truth. Um, uh, now, I have my opinions and my feelings about that, okay, but um, having been here for a while, I'm able to actually go, okay, no, that's just the way that they do things here. It's not considered rude. It's a social norm, and it's not, it's not uh, you know, and so maybe there's things behind that psychologically or whatever, like how the culture developed over the last several decades or several hundreds or, or thousands of years when Chinese culture has been developing for 5,000 years. Um, but the ability to um, write or you, can, or you can talk about it, but uh, I recommend writing down the truth about a situation and then, uh, and then observing, trying to observe it from an objective point of view and trying to give it a trying to give it a narrative that is accurate or reasonable. Um, sometimes there are really actually rude or evil people in the world. I mean, that's pretty intense, but sometimes there are really are rude people in the world. But, um, but most of the time that people aren't necessarily trying to be rude. Um, and so in that, in that foreign culture, we can back away from that situation from an emotional point of view and reinterpret the narrative that we're telling ourselves. Because what, when we're coming into feelings of frustration um, or, or having a hard time dealing with things, it's normally because we're inserting narratives um, that produce those kinds of feelings. And so they're actually, of course, there can actually be frustrating or uh, angering or, or situation, situations that we encounter where, where an, appropriate emo, an, an appropriate emotional response of anger or frustration or something like that or stress is totally expected and, just, and justified. However, um, if, we, if we have some tools to help us deal with those difficult circumstances in a foreign country or even interacting with someone who uh, does things in a, in a way that's, that we're not used to, um, or whatever circumstance where there are negative uh, feelings being produced uh, or that we're feeling, 
whatever we can do to um, help ourselves feel empowered um, in regards to those feelings um, by stepping back, by telling the truth in a factual way, and then uh, reinterpreting the narratives that have been producing those feelings, uh, it can help to reduce those feelings or at least give us some perspective. Um, and so, um, anyways, um, thanks for uh, thanks for watching today. Um, I'm hoping to uh, make these uh, video blog uploads um, a more commonplace. Um, so that um, yeah, people can get a better grasp of uh, Chinese culture um, and uh, my point of view. Um, I don't plan on uh, talking about just one thing on this blog channel. Uh, this will just be basically a record of my life uh, and my thoughts. Um, but um, moving on, I think tonight I'll spend uh, the next maybe hour or two um, uh, doing some writing and um, highly recommend uh, I've been reading uh, Steve Jobs autobiography uh, and I must say that um, as uh, strange as Steve Jobs was he was anything but boring definitely an exciting person um, and so I really appreciate listening to autobiographies I use audible um, personally uh, to um, to read a lot of books um, but reading biographies like Steve Jobs or Benjamin Franklin Al uh, Albert Einstein or a number or other figures uh, like another one I'm working on is um, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln but what they do is um, because of uh, the uniqueness of those their personalities it helps actually reveal like it uh, gives me like a, a compare a comparative like a case study that I can compare myself to to see <laughs> how I'm doing, how I'm similar, how I'm different from those people. Um, and not only that, but it gives me a really good memory anchor. Um, if you're not aware of how our memory works, um, our memory is like a spider web um, and it works off of uh, connections. So um, if we can have one, like one central anchoring um, idea or person or phrase um, that's memorable then we can link we can start to um, build on that uh, memory link and uh, so there's really powerful ways to do that but for me one powerful way to build a body of knowledge is to make it focal around a figure personally that works well and so um, when reading uh, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography or Albert Einstein or other figures, um, those people don't exist in a vacuum. They exist within cultures, within ways of thinking and language um, and profession. And so it really, a person actually becomes not only, uh, like an autobiography becomes not only a window into that person, but also a window into the broader culture. And personally, like, I've tried to listen to, like, just straight history uh, books. And, like, uh, I, it's, I just don't, I don't, I, I don't stay interested in those because they, they seem to be so general. Um, and, um, and they tend to follow a sequential order, um, uh, but history books do and you know starting at some point and working forward from there um, um, at least the the, uh, the handful that I've tried um, um, if you can even say a handful maybe a couple but um, but a, but an autobiography even though it, it, it does go sequentially it's also tied to that central figure so um, so everything that happens in that book has to do with that central figure and how they're related to by other people and by the culture and how they um, the kinds of decisions that they made in their lives and how they made a difference and what was unique about them um, and so yeah anyways I recommend the Steve Jobs uh, autobiography um, um, and uh, you can get it on audible.com uh, that's where I got it um, or I'm sure they have it on Kindle but 
anyways, uh, not a commercial, just a recommendation. But um, anyways, um, I hope that uh, something in this blog has uh, has helped you. And uh, please, um, uh, before you go, if you if this helped you out, hit the subscribe button or like like it or comment on it. I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on uh, anything that I've mentioned today and to interact with you and get to know you. And bye-bye. Um,